Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Home for Humanity podcast. My name is Sarah Liljegren. I am a mover, shaker, and producer of cool, magical things. And today I bring you an interview with the beautiful and amazing and talented and passionate and inspiring Patricia. And I was wondering... Hi. Can and I instead of me cuz I know you as an embodied yoga principles teacher, I know you as a family constellations therapist, I know you as a dear friend. I know you as a fellow body witch and explorer of somatic mysteries. Um but and right before we started recording, we were asking how we wanted to show up to this and I'm wondering if you could introduce yourself with how you are today and maybe a bit more of your professional background, Um, but how are you and who are you? Thank you. (laughs) Happy to be here. And thank you for that introduction. I always love to connect through your words. Um, Where am I? Um, You know... Uh, I guess this is going to be an introduction of myself, but I'm going to step into the topics that I, that we've uh, discussed about maybe potentially talking about today. And one, one of the things that I also feel that we uh, resonate around is truth seekers. Hmm. And maybe, I don't know if on a philosophical level, maybe sometimes, but on, on that quest of finding what, what rings true to you. And I definitely, I think I I would put myself in this category of people uh, and definitely something that I feel that I'm in uh, today. Um, and I wouldn't say that it's something that, oh yeah, look at me, I'm such a good person because I'm a truth seeker. Because this is hard stuff. It's not easy stuff. And I've said this to the, you know, like therapist in... Uh, who's my therapist at the moment like sometimes I really wish it would be simpler for me right Um, because truth seeking is not something that's necessarily encouraged in a lot of the spaces that we inhabit today and also it takes a level of courage that I don't think it's easy to sustain by by self by our by our own by ourselves and rather, it's a it's a courage that's built, of course, yeah, you yourself and you're only in charge of yourself and all of that stuff. But I mean, it's done in the support of people around us. And as I say this, I'm looking at the plants in front of me and I see how they look so gorgeous and they grow together as a whole. And this is how I see that 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 path of of pursuit of not not necessarily pursuit of happiness, but the pursuit of what rings true to you. And I and I see that uh, I I see that in yourself as well, right? That we share this path of, oh, this is something that I vibrate with, something that I I'm interested in, that I developed a natural curious curiosity in, and that I feel that I want to walk towards that, and starting those paths and those adventures and wherever they take us. <laughs> yeah, so that's sort of like where I am. A bit of an introduction uh, of of who I am. Um, I am a somatic therapist. I call it so systemic somatic uh, therapy because I use a lot of intergenerational and familiar uh, dynamics into what's happening with the person, um, and I use the body a lot, a lot. I mean, I love that. Now that's very normal to say. At some point, I uh, expressed it in very like shamanic terms of how the body was, it was important to consider in the work. Now, it's good to know that there are uh, scientific stuff that say why the body is important. So now we have the the permission to think Mm -hmm. that that is reality and that that's (laughs) important. So, um, yeah, I do family constellations workshops from time to time in my one-on-ones I use the philosophy of it as sometimes I use the tools in it uh, depending on what the person needs I am definitely um, about finding where the person is at the moment rather when, rather than where they should be that's that's why what I do most of the time I, I also train some people 
I teach um, and I work on my one-on-ones, which is my my favorite part of, of my work and my day. And um, I've been doing this for uh, over a decade. And yeah, I guess that's professionally a short introduction, yeah. Oh, lovely, beautiful, thank you. Um, I I really wanted you to introduce yourself in that way and and because something you asked me beforehand was how are you and I feel like something that is lacking has been lacking in my life lately I've been working seven days a week doing all these different feeling like different things where I feel like I have to compartmentalize and the simple even asking myself how am I I have, I almost haven't had the space or made the space to truly answer that. And so when we hopped on, you were like, how are you? Are you okay? And I can't stop thinking about that. That's just on top of mind resonating in my ears. Like, having people who care deeply, how are you, is like a nutrient that just to know there's someone who's going to show up and listen um you know it feels like these days we have to pay for that um the the amount of close connections and best friends i I, this is a weird statistic i don't know why i have a statistic replaying like i always not always but in moments like these i think of this thing that I heard that like 10, 20 years ago, people had on average two best friends and then it went down to one best friend. And now it's like less than one. Like that's how few people have, have someone they can really trust to show up like that. So yeah, it, it feels like threads of, of connection to, to the humanity of each other. Like to, to ask that question and to answer it honestly, feels like a level of embodiment that, that and presence that most people don't have and I think it's one reason I haven't felt well lately is because I haven't I feel like been able to do it well and so much of that is stress um and these modern stressors like jobs and careers and where am I going to live and where do I want to do that and can um yeah, I, I'm curious with with your work, everything I just described about my life. I'm, I, I feel like you probably see very similar things, and so, do you see any 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 patterns, or you know, does that lack of connection come up for you when you meet with other I mean, people and clients and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of times I say this shouldn't be something that people have to pay for, right? <laughs> when I'm <laughs> And I mean, of course, I'm happy to receive people wherever they're at, but but I mean, therapy is about, in a way, fixing stuff. And I know that the philosophical debate is, no, no we, there's nothing to fix. True, but we wouldn't be looking for therapy if we don't need help, right? And sometimes it's like, oh, you know, it's like something's gone wrong with something in your house and you need a special person to come in and help you fix that quote unquote whatever people want to make out of the definition of fixing but sometimes it's just like regular sweeping or regular dusting and that I don't think we should need therapy for that right we shouldn't have to find a person who's able to listen and care deeply for I mean and of course lots of people who you pay don't really care or don't necessarily come from this place of like oh there's a person in front of me tell me about your world super interesting to me even if we're not necessarily related I want to hear about you I care and sometimes we do pay for those sessions even though the person doesn't necessarily give us that that space but yeah yeah like I said sometimes I I think we have to go to therapy for things that should be provided in, in community and the other thing that that's very clear to me from what you're sharing is that that level of deep bonding, deep listening, deep sharing, and deep caring, we lack many of those bonds outside of ourselves. 
And sometimes the only space where that can happen is in intimate relationships, like partners and romantic relationships. And that is such a huge burden. I mean, <laughs> I'm all for deep connection with your partner, of course, but having that the only place where we get this can play very weird games, let's say in the letting go of that person or in the choosing the person or in, they don't have to be the best at everything that I need or understand everything that I that I want to be listened and tuned into. But the, community-wise, socially, social, socially, we have created so very few spaces where these things really can happen. And it feels like a natural thing to do in our intimate relationships because they're, they're close. We get to know those, those those people very closely. We care about them. But does it have to be that way? Yeah. Oh, you've taken an interesting turn. And I want to go there because um, I have this feeling of the needs that community can that that the needs that community can meet and how much that I don't know why identity is coming up because your identity plays such a role in community and who you are in community and which communities you're part of and even the word community it's like you we we the neighborhoods you know you get to know your neighborhood but then <clears throat> there's the other neighborhoods and then the the natural boundaries our brains and our reality place on things and um, how to go between, I think we were, we were speaking before um, on like how to interface between your identity and your community and the thing that you are not, like the other. There's the us and then there's the them. And that happens on so many levels. But you're right that for a lot of people, and, and I can only speak from my personal experience and everyone I've talked to. Um, so maybe you can speak more to this is why, why that is being met in intimate relationships. Um, because then you have this, it seems like a new identity shift when that relationship changes. And my question now is like, can you, can you go through identity shifts and like community shifts within one relationship? Because you're talking about needs now that if you can identify and meet in other ways, these relationships become very complex now. <laughs> it is a very huge question. And I think we could talk about just this for hours on end. Um, one thing that comes to my mind when I hear you uh, talk about this is this idea of, you know, we've heard this, how our, our culture lacks ritual, right? Our culture lacks transition rituals. And the classical um, transition or ritual uh, experience is this, you know, uh, in a these uh, cultures where they would leave the little boy in the jungle and have him you know like survive the night or three days or whatever this is sort of like the classical this this is what we we lost and this is what we need and strangely enough in a lot of of our cultures those transitions are left to regular like let's say uh you get married so now you are of age that's sort of like your coming of age uh phase or having a child so now you're not you're not the young woman anymore. Now you are a mother, right? Or this these transitions are usually usually marked by marriage, or by having children. Both of these experiences have to do with another person. So there's, I mean, I know that there are. Um, I'm trying to speak very generally because it, this is different uh, in in cultures. I mean, it's not the same thing to talk about you know, someone in a high income uh, place in a first world country versus a woman in a low middle class in a Latin country where she has very little capacity to have like a nice um, growth uh, professionally or 
maybe not even the word profession comes into mind for these people, right? But their idea of um, growing into life has to do with getting married and having children, right? That's their way to be, um, to be in life. So, I mean, again, speaking that there's a distinction um, of how this will be taking shape uh, in different cultures, but many of these important transitions are marked by other, by a partner. So of course it makes sense to who am I, of course, after a divorce, who am I if I'm not a married woman? Who am I without the plans that I made with my partner? Because those are the plans that would define you, having children and what these children need. And that defines the road of life uh, that you take, right? Is this wrong? Not necessarily. But of course, again, in the context of the cultures and the society that, that, we're, that we've built, it makes it really hard. And I'm not saying while yes there are women or people who will jump on on their identity of i am a mother this is what i am so my sexuality now is out the door uh, my priority is my children so my partner is no longer so um i'm going to choose everything in my life like my life from my car my house where i live based on what my children need so it's like th these things actually do happen but at the same time People who don't necessarily want to jump on that or don't have the need to ident to base their identity on that. The fact that children need so many resources <laughs> just makes it impossible or makes it really hard. I admire parents who are on these paths, make it really hard to do it at it in a different way. Why? Just because they take up so much of your time and so much of your money, you know. Oh, I hate to like linger, but like there's so many it the the identity I do okay, I'll switch gears because I feel like we I could just go down that rabbit hole of identity and and especially when you're talking about family constellations. I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? is family relationships. And something I hear over and over again, like um the past couple years in i want to call it like sovereignty work because there's many sources that i'm pulling from talking about this but the authority the relationship to authority and this and this is um tangently related to the identity question because i feel like sometimes and for for me i i kind of have this identity of being anti-authority because i once I see the corruption in an, in an authority figure, it's hard for me to undo that that's how I see the authority. Um, but but we learn some of these things from relationships in families. And so, um, and if a family doesn't have the ritual that you're speaking of and doesn't put in place for the child, um, here's 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 where you are here's where you're going there is this lack of direction and and from my from my experience my rituals that I went through were religious and that was a huge part of my identity and I feel like I have spent maybe the entire time since I've left the church wrestling with this identity around being a religious person since it was such it was who I was and so I have struggled with, um, okay, whose authority do do I listen to and follow through in and believe in and represent? Because it, it turns out I have to like stand up for something and do something and choose something. Um, but there is still this like wrestling of, um, but if I am just anti-authority, does, does that just translate to everywhere in my life? And um, how can ritual retrain any of that confusion because I know that what I just described I am not alone in feeling I mean I'm watching you nod and I have talked to so many other humans um I want to say women because it seems like a lot of this is a maybe a pattern for women since we're talking about like creating an identity after relationships but Yeah, do I have a question in there? You look like you have a thought. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it is a huge uh, topic and it's, I think, I'm glad people are talking about it. Like I hear the conversation out there mm. and I think we need to be adding layers because it is a very complex thing. And sometimes it's easy for, let's say, uh, taking on the topic that we were discussing right before, uh, yeah, I see as a woman how much I've given into child caring. So I want to disidentify with that and, and be a woman again and feel like myself again. And it's like, you know, screw it. I don't have to do all, all of that. That's an imposition from society. And going to this um, empowerment or sovereignty, as you were saying, mm -hmm. like this idea of, of empowerment, which is sounds good. I think it's a good thing to do. But there's a level where things will become paradoxical because we have a need to feel like yourself, to feel your own sovereign self. But at the same time, you care for a child. And if you want to do it, I mean, if you deep start getting your nose into books about what's the best thing that you can do with your children, you'll find about attachment. And you're, you'll hear that the most attuned and available you are to your child, the better for them. So it's like, how the, do you combine both things, right? Because one is go and do your thing, tune into yourself, find the time and space for your for your things. But at the other on the other end, it's about being available for your child and all of the capacity that it requires. Because I know that it just sounds poetic to be present for your child, but the amount of energy it takes is huge. And just the fact that you need to not have like four loads of work, blows housework to do to be able to be present, then it's not so poetic when it when we talk about the realistic way to do those things. So I know this is still hard to come to terms with, but this is not an individual solution only, right? it needs to come with a shift outside and what's outside the way that we live, the way that we're structured, the social and the economical and the political structure that we live in. I, of course, this is not to say, oh, it's only about what the changes that they bring. It needs to be parallel. It needs to be co come from both sides. It's not this paternal attitude of government should take care of other things. And it's all about welfare practices and maternity leaves. It's, that's important, but it's also about self-responsibility. And it's also not just about self-responsibility and it's all up to me. Don't wait for anybody to help you. Uh, you're not a victim. All of these things that tend to be uh, too reliant on the self, which is of course an extreme, but it really, when when I say that it, there, there's a, a balance where, it, where it, it becomes paradoxical, it's really like a stop because we cannot go further only doing it alone and we cannot go further just by waiting for policies to change. So it's it's a it's a both kind of thing, right? Yeah. I I my next question might be kind of weird, but I the solution that I see here in America is very limiting because it's just from my perspective. Um but the theme I'm gathering as a new realtor and someone who just moved from the Midwest to the Pacific Northwest and someone who's really interested in holistic solutions. Um, I'm looking at the food system issues and the housing issues and this issue that we're describing and middle class housing and maybe middle middle affordability housing housing and the way we're living and the access the access to community feels like a really <clears throat> real like realistic way of of building this community that can like look out for each other in a way and I'm curious what what it's like where you live if like you see a relationship between these things um the access we have to living comfortably among each other and this what it feels like we need the societal trust back in home and in community and maybe closer community so that we can actually have more 
control over shaping the culture we live in um what seems to be the solution here because in in my mind and my like generator human design person I'm just like I can create all the power I can do it all (laughs) and it's like actually no but um but I can invest in communities that can help other people lean on each other so that we can get closer to this way of living that we all talk about and seem to have the resources to be able to do if we aren't all too burnt out to do it um so it seems like an, an actual infrastructure change is needed and um yeah my solution oriented eyes are like housing <laughs> um middle middle housing and like more access to easier living than this fuckery that we've created um so yeah what's yeah. it like where you are and do you see those that relationship i i love that you phrase it as easier living and i and i can almost feel how how weird it is for a lot of people or how disconcerting to hear the word easy because yeah. a lot of these like eurocentric heritage cultures and even in, in in places like where i live that's um not considered so eurocentric we have that influence as well the idea of hard is glorified hard work effort you know uh you know, earn your whatever, your vacation, your pleasure, your leisure, you should earn it. So this idea of hard, so making making life easy. And is that is that lazy? Is that, you know, all of these ideas around these concepts, just a fact is what's promoting this type of living that we that we are living in, right? Um it is different. Of course it is different. And I and I think that's one of the things that I really like about about this systemic perspective or the family constellations uh, philosophy takes a systemic perspective. And what does this mean? That the fact that a, that a country can have access to a lot of things for their own consumption, that's built somewhere else where in order for that to be avail- those products to be available at such an accessible price for the, the, the commonality of the people, it needs to be done in a cheap place. So it needs to be done in a place where that the, it's the other people who take the toll. And when we lack the systemic vision, we forget to see that that's coming from somewhere yeah. or that I am related to what's happening in another country. I am related, my consumption habits are related to what's happening with the policies of another country that's affecting that other country. And it can be as big as economic policies and uh, let's say China and what they did for economic growth. Economic growth means I want to sell to the world so that the world feels that you are living like a good life because I have access to a lot of things to the expense of what that policy is in China meant for them and for the people who live there and for all of the girls who are not allowed to be born for many years. So that is something that we are all in. This is a systemic perspective. And those who have like an allergy to, I'm not responsible for that. I had no influence in that. We benefit, we do benefit from that, right? Even if the people, even if it's not you and you live in a very different bubble, separate from, from the world exper- experience, um, the people who brought you to life benefited from that. So we're, we're all in this together in a sense, right? Um, and acknowledging this, this systemic vision will will allow this as you say oh i can i can i can or a lot of people can go like yeah i want to do this thing it's it's about me empowerment and it's about envisioning and i I, and i hear a lot of this like just wake up super early and get to work and it's about having clarity of vision and you you're going to get to your goals or the women empowerment of the you know get it sister it's about you know asking for it when let's say you have like a a uh, family in you know rural I don't know Colombia or Mexico or wherever you, you lots of places still have this condition where there's 10 kids in the family and the parent says I cannot pay for access to to education for all of you guys so n- the women won't won't be able to have that so it's not the same thing same thing to say go sister just go get it it's just about asking for it right when they need to be working 
uh, to be able to sustain the family. And that, why? Because the economical conditions are heavier there than in other countries where the policies are more friendly to a certain wider uh, population. Is there a middle ground philosophy that that like, despite where you are on that spectrum, that that like, is there like a holistic view that you can hold that because I see, you know, in the entrepreneur startup world investment world, you know, boss girl, babe, like investment women, women who give who build wealth. Yeah, just get up early, grind, like work hard, hustle. Um, you know, and then I had a coach who was like, Sarah, you aren't like a eighth generation sweet potato farmer with with that as your only prospect. Like that's I have a different opportunity, which I feel like is why I I I want to do the boss girl get the money build something cool because I have the opportunity to do it and I and I and I struggle with 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 oscillating between the I'm nobody I don't deserve to be selling million dollar houses in Seattle and the fucking get it like I can do you know (laughs) um so yeah it seems it seems like you know, some roomy quote could, could cover that, but what's your take on, on like the more nuanced view that, that women can hold about opportunities? That it's that, I mean, again, it's huge and I'm very passionate about dissecting all of these things. Actually, I mean, I didn't mention in in the brief introduction, but I also have a background of something that I studied years ago, um, but I, I was in economics. So I, I love, and one of the things that I think I, pulled me initially to uh, studying economics was for precisely the systemic view, right? <laughs> Again, even though now I'm, 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 I'm talking about people, but um, economy is about the systemics, the systemic play of what happens on one end, what happens on the other end. But um, I mean, cause your question has a lot to do with, is that possible to find like a, a middle, a middle ground? Um, However, when you express it in your way, like how do I handle the capacity that I can do these things that, uh, and I think it's one of the conversations that probably are in the way of of getting ready to be handled openly and with ease is how do I handle my privilege, right? How do I handle the fact that I can do these things or that I'm in this place? And I think it's important to not be ashamed of it. Uh, Sometimes people probably think uh, that's that's the way to go in order to not f- see this lack of privilege somewhere else. And the fact that I have it, then how do I manage shame and you know simplify uh, my my own things? I think it's important more than that. It's what do I do with the power that I have, rather than it should just be equal and just like slim it down, right? And and cut trim trim the trees that have grown not necessarily from their own capacity, but just life gave them that chance, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to say about that, but instead of ripping it off, owning it. Um, on, a, on, a individ- on, on a healthy individual perspective, we wanna, we wanna get hold of where individual power can show up. For the person that I described, that that woman who very uh, from a very early age was told there's not enough and you are the one of the ones who are not gonna get it, right? We're not gonna get that chance to grow. Um, this, even though there are some economical and social outside conditions that need to improve to help and support that woman, we want to find even the tiniest sprout of power and individuality that we can for this person. And the same applies to anyone on another position. Where Where is it that you are able to get this job, get these resources? How can I own it? How can I make the best of it then, right? Sometimes the best of it without a, a systemic perspective is 
greed. I'll just do what I want with it. Um, more, just more for the sake of more with like these blindfolds of I'm only here for, for me, right? Again, I'm not saying this, that we should see it from like a guilt trip kind of way, more than connecting to this is where I'm at. This is where I belong in a, in a, in a community. What do I actually want to do with this? What, what, what calls me, what motivates me from this connected place, right? A connected place. Yeah. I do think that is such a potent question. And thank you for articulating that because it's a fine line that I, I have found that I have chosen to walk. It feels because um, to the degree I disadvantage myself um, seems to be and I, I, we were speaking before about I, I hate self-sabotage just the phrase I'm like it's silly why would no what you don't ever actually try I don't I'm not trying to harm myself but it does seem like certain things come up where I'm like oh this really over time <laughs> is pretty apparent and and thinking I can and then going and doing it um you know it is it's um it feels like a privilege it feels like a mindset it feels like a positive mindset um and but then again the the what holds me back is like that same the same like i don't deserve to um and so that's always present even in in the um I have the power. I know I have the individual power to show up in this way. I know I have the opportunities and I choose, you know, to apply for this job and show up to, to, for this cause. And, um, yeah, I, I guess there's just still seems to be more of a conversation there. Maybe, maybe that's where I'm coming to. Um, and, and, and where, where because you it this reminds me of the work of of Paul Linden with the love and power and how do people find that individual power because whatever the opportunities before you like I said it's still um yeah is this this mindset of I can and I will and that's what privilege feels like to me is the capacity to say I will because I have the resources and um, that I guess that's where I was I, I mean with like the downside for me has been I always think I can because that's the privilege of always thinking I can um, but I've just come to a point where I can't anymore <laughs> and a lot of people yeah hit hit that wall so yeah um ritual seems to be a thing that keeps me centered in all of this all this spinning around even with like the problems that that I I feel like it, it's a feminine way to describe problems that come full circle but what do you see as as rituals that can keep people centered in this question yes that would be a really a really nice um way to center around all of this as you said and you were mentioning something around this I can and I will aspect that I love. And um, I'm going to go back to this and, and thread it into the what are the rituals we need. And this vision of I can, I will that are um, usually associated with communities of privilege. I I see it as if I could label it some like title the movie in some ways, the, the love of summer. And what I mean by that is the always producing, always shiny, always correct, always. I mean, I, I am amazed when I go to this uh, countries, and of course it's not the same everywhere in the country, right? But cities that seem so polished and so like homes look so pretty and, and you know, like as if they just un unwrap them, right? And that you don't see in other countries. In other countries, you feel the decay more. And why? Because there are not as many resources. The manufacturing processes are not so fast and ready to, to you know, repair and and buy the next thing. Because the 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 repair thing is on the store, um, you know, 
right next door and you have all of these like standard sizes that are easy in most countries you don't have that right it's like a guy that you call and maybe he gets it maybe he won't so there's the 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 being familiar with the decay process is in a sense a ritual that's not always summary you know it not always you know people are going to freak out when you're in love with summer if you go to the store and what you want to get is not on the shelf right and that's like oh, but when is it going to get there but can i have it mailed home how long is it going to take oh no we have this two day shipping kind of thing or the same day delivery don't worry right so don't go out outside of summer where it's always pretty always available always there always same right and this sorry there's none none in stock is very common or was very common uh like this is part of nature this is part of life right the mango tree gives a, a, a mangoes in uh what is it like late july i mean depending on the country right but uh right so and and the fact that we have to develop that somatic part of oh i cannot get it right now that is a part of a ritual of sliding into fall sliding into winters working through the process of spring and i know that now it's very trendy in social media to talk about uh the correct use of dopamine in the body and having yourself to have healthier doses of dopamine and not getting to this addiction cycles that are super common now weirdly enough in this summer culture um part of of what the dopamine uh healthy recommendation thing is to do is to effort uh reward effort reward and so so sort of like don't post um uh, and that's not the word knowing how to do dosify your dopamine dopamine that you get so again, that's that's the spring, right? So it does re require some effort to get things available. So um, like on an even more general terms, a ritual is knowing, um, I mean, this is something that, I, that I've that i heard phrases. Um, we used to know where your food com was coming from because you saw that it was close to your home or it didn't take you a lot to go outside of the city to see that when you lived in a city, right? Um, you knew the processes of things and now people don't, children generally don't. Where where does milk come from? From, from the store, right? So that in itself, I know it's not a precise ritual, but it's a part of education that belongs to a ritual where you see a cycle, a cycle of life, a cycle of being. And in a sense, and I know this is another triggering word in the summering culture, but you are dependent on these things right <laughs> we are dependent on air we are dependent on the fact that the, that air is clean enough right and again the summer perspective is i never want to feel like a victim i never want to be dependent on anything and it's all up to me all up to me all up to me but that's not sustainable that's not reality that's not at least in this in this earth in this rock that we live in there's a cycle around things there's sustainability around things and rituals in the very, like if we go, oh, what, what does the definition say? Or if we go to the encyclopedia of what rituals are or what they're meant to, to do, we usually go to this, like, let's say the classical Celtic, but lots of cultures had this uh, culture of ritual. And the first thing that you'll find on those books is they did ritual on changes, uh, on season changes. Again, so, oh, this is when we don't get enough light. So we need to pack the provisions for that time. This is when this happens. So how do you tune into that? How does your life change when, right? Some of our culture doesn't like change. It always stays the same. It always delivers the same. So how many of our industries are geared to our productivity that always gives you the same thing? You know, that's the basis of this huge uh, companies where no matter where you are, there's this hamburger company that's going to deliver the same thing. Don't you worry about having to digest change, right? <laughs> so wherever you are, you're going to find your coffee the way that you like it. You're going to use the same words. You're going to see the same people looking at you. So don't you will, will never feel different. You will never have to 
think, oh, there's a me and there's an, there's an other that I have to process, right? So yeah, I mean, lots to talk about on this, but I think this is a bit of a oh, an overview of all this. <laughs> I adore that your answer was listen to the seasons because this goes back to our identity, sharing the identity of being a body witch, because we we talk about like how to be more in our leadership, our sovereignty, our power, our choice, our access to choice, our bodies um, is in is connection with the 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 world, the, our environments, and that means living with the seasons, and that means <clears throat> a relationship to the light and the dark, and all the layers of that, and and it feels like. Um, Oh, I love that we just, we think we live in this eternal summer. That has been one of the hardest things for me in, um, since COVID is it seemed more like reality to me that, that these like challenges in the food system were broken. And it has been really hard for me to watch a society go back, just go back to like, everything is totally fine and normal. And, and these, these like massive holes in the way we are connected to our food system are still there and um yeah that doesn't seem to have been challenged at all um and I saw that opportunity as and maybe it's just where I was in my life I was in kind of a weird place right as COVID happened but I when I when I saw um so many people just lose all access to food it seemed like their complete dependency on semis, you know, to go to their local grocery store and then no knowledge and no knowledge about, about of any other way. It terrified me to my core that most of our society seems to be functioning in this way. And mm-hmm. that's why I went to survival school. That's why I went and learned some bushcraft skills and um, did a, a developed a sit spot and a relationship to the daily changes in the seasons of my immediate environment. Um, and so that seems like a natural progression of like, oh, well, here's the, here's the crisis. Um, we need to be more connected to our food system, to our seasons, to our environment, to our communities. And that's, I feel like why I'm building the things I'm building and, and home for humanity means the, the fullness of all of that. And, the food system we need it's it's we need we are food you know and that connection to to a place it's amazing that that's where you went because I'm just like yeah wow it always goes back to that doesn't it it's like relationship to our food and our people and our neighbors and um and not being so dependent it's thank you for saying that too because it's a scary thought and I try not to think about it too much, <laughs> but it's why um, I'm doing the work I'm doing, at least in, in real estate and outdoor education, because that seems, yeah, to be where it's at. Yeah. And this idea of always delivering or presenting ourselves or your stock, you know, <laughs> in your, in your store um, as always constant, always the same is so per- pervasive like it's it it's it's trickled down to to our very core right you know like we were earlier talking about parenthood and how mothers have this need to always be happy always be smiley always be in your best energy and availability and always having these polished kids to present right and that's again not sustainable to your body to always be okay to never have as you mentioned, the answer of how are you and not be okay, that can be so challenging for a lot of people to accept, not not to say it out loud, I'm not even going there, but to accept to yourself today, I'm not well. And, and the fact that we are cyclical and that's okay. And that's sort of like, today's a cloudy day, today's a clear day, today's a sunny day. And that applies to our bodies as well as part of nature that we are. And it's just, again, not sustainable. I know technologies will are attempting to, yes, we can produce food out of non-natural sources 
to make us less dependent. I don't know, might work. There's an ethical debate around that. I have no idea, but our bodies for now are also natural and cyclical. And if we push ourselves, there's this burnout syndrome. There's autoimmune diseases that have to do with being on high cortisol levels for extended period of time. That's been, again, proven and people are sort of like starting to see once and again, our bodies cannot sustain high levels of expectation so long. So, so it would make sense to you that I, I have a funny little quick story. So I was with family over my winter break. I went back home to the Midwest and somebody, um, do you know the ritual about eating black eyed peas on new year's day? It's, it's a, I think little folk tradition. And, um, I mentioned, oh, we, sh- I, sh- I saw black eyed peas. I should have gotten them. Someone was like, oh, don't worry. Um, like all those but all the stores are closed now it's too late and they were like oh don't worry i have a little cart thing and they within like 10 minutes were like oh it'll be here tomorrow or tonight or something like someone was going to just immediately deliver and and i i don't know why that bothered me but i was like that we can't we have got and i remember not that long ago when like two week delivery was like this new thing like two weeks you could get something from anywhere and now um like now that's our solution within 10 minutes you can have what you want within a few hours and pay 10 times the price for it and that's just normal and that's just like our my new reality like no wonder I can feel the cortisol shooting out of my ears and my eyeballs because this isn't sustainable my body is screaming at me that that these things aren't sustainable and you know we have the, the, you bring up the, the artificial food sources. I mean, my time in the dietetics and nutrition world were enough to really turn me off from, um, some of that kind of science, because I look at just the spaces that most folks have in their yard to grow food and don't. And then the statistics on victory gardens during world war II help the war effort, grow your own food and how much that actually buffered resources. And if like, if we can preserve our efforts for growing our own food for a global war, like, couldn't we do it for a better cause? Couldn't we do it for like preventative health for our communities and the world and our, our future generations and not do it so we can go to war with our neighbors? Um, I mean, that I, Victory Gardens are a, a small, but powerful example of like grassroots change and like and just the fact I mean and people seem to be interested in that and it is trendy the sustainable green energy and being around um Seattle and western Washington there's there's a lot of science and research and like different ecosystems demand different things and so this is another thing that like on a yeah on a on a cultural like it's always sunny Um, that's not true anywhere, but the things that people think that are sustainable, I don't know, I'm getting on kind of a tangent, but like in some places it won't be true for other places, but what seems to be the threat everywhere. Yeah. Is this, um, it's always summer. Yeah. Like you said, um, which yeah, yeah, globally isn't sustainable, but not everyone can, can grow their own food either. So I recognize that too. Yes. Yeah. It it is. I mean, again, from even from the therapy uh, world, like I said, it really gets gets into our bones. How? Oh, it's about fixing yourself so that you can go back to that. Uh, you know, thread running around chasing something. So it's just this thing that you need to fix, right? Again, so that you're in the summer and you see it in the way that women want to present themselves as well right prolong that youth for us more the the most that you can again i again a difficulty it's like a lack of an enzyme into uh going into other seasons right i cannot my body goes goes insane as you said like i i I cannot get it as fast and it's not there. Why, why is it not there? I have a right, right. (laughs) And these things start to come up and um, yeah, like you were saying before, I mean, 
I, I see with, you know, like streaming services, how all the movies that you want are available anytime, pretty much at any time, just on, on a click. And when, back when we were younger, um, um, it was about waiting for that to, to like the channel, you know, the national TV or whatever it is, cable, yeah. to, to have that on their programming, right? Mm -hmm. So again, there's the waiting process. And I'm not saying, oh, it, things were good before and, and sort of like this nostalgia or of the past. Of course, there's a lot of things that come out of uh, advancing in technology. Medical stuff is great. And I mean, the fact that you can get something that you really need delivered very uh, uh, quickly, that a, a, can be very helpful sometimes. But it's important to notice, as you mentioned, how my body is starting to speed up in a way that's not sustainable. And then I get anxiety and then I cannot sleep. So make use of those things. I, and I, I, I think this is a very nice exercise to not use the fast shipping option when you don't need it to be a fast shipping option. Sort of like allowing your natural process, like saying that technology is available when you need it, when you actually want it but not necessarily as, as a speeding up of the life that, that, that you're living every day. I love that, 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 that that's an, a ritual option that you're saying is like the ritual of speed and being mindful of speed. Um, like I once heard that rushing is a trauma response and just rushing for no need. And sometimes like ever since hearing that, I find myself like rushing and I'm like, whoa, I have more time than I think I do. Um, so why am I stuck in this instant gratification mode? And like, that's when I start to get into like, oh, these patterns of of that like noticing seems to be like you said like the most important thing because I guess it, it will it will be different for different people um like the new things that are brought in and I just feel overwhelmed with like um the speed at which things go sometimes and so that's that's a good um ritual for people to just be mindful of yeah and if I just may add on that again because we tend to to move from extremes right so it is true that rushing without the need to rush can be a trauma response. But that clarification that I inserted, because a lot of people will go, so I'm never rushing again, right? <laughs> rushing is, right, and pushing that away. So having to rush or feeling the need that you have to rush when you don't have to rush, that's the trauma response. But the capacity to rush is installed in your survival body so mm -hmm. that you rush when you need to get the hell out of somewhere, right? So that's a part of, of your of your body and that's natural and that's healthy. So having the spectrum is healthy. The The trauma response is being stuck in one response. And that's not necessarily what I would, would wanna choose for that particular moment. So again, embracing your whole humanity without any fear of either of the edges, rushing or slowing down, both can be trauma responses. So it depends, it depends, yeah. Totally. Yep. Yeah. The, the home that houses the fullness of our humanity is the, is the, our, our own, our own experiences, our own body. Um, yeah. Do you, do you have time for a couple more questions? Uh, maybe, maybe just one. One. Okay. Um, good. Because I was feeling like this is, this is kind of coming to a natural close and my, my final, um, big question that I have now is what gives you hope for a better future that does house that that can make space what gives you hope that there are spaces and we can create more places out there that people do have have these things that um I, I mean I, I'm thinking go ahead oh sorry yeah I no because I'm thinking of I'll, I'll just say I'm thinking of like like we've talked about tools We've talked about stories and region and experiences and identities and um, what are the things um, that are needed that that you see that help provide you hope for a future that that people can have all these different levels of their humanity met. Uh, yeah, like I said, lots of lots of answers start flowing in my head. Uh, but I'll I'll tag along the the technology piece that we just mentioned, and I know that there's a lot of 
not great things coming out of it. And I myself will complain about that a lot constantly. But I love the awareness that people can have because we're being exposed to a lot of information. And I know that that can be also like a bad thing and create trauma responses uh, on that or than that uh, on itself. But I like the fact that that's available. And lots of people can have can be starting to cultivate their own awareness and being aware, oh, things are not just the way that I see them. Life is not just the way that I experience it. Or my opinion is my opinion, not the truth, right? Just the fact that we can state things that way, like, oh, this is what I think about this, rather than this is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is usually... So this, this being sort of like in the possibility of getting in touch or getting close to other realities, I think is super enriching or has the potential to be super enriching. Of course, not. I see also a lot of awareness uh, that's being gained now is a bit heady or not digested nor matured enough. Uh, but I would say that's part of the process of getting somewhere that's really understanding what's going, what's going on for all of us here. Awesome. I love all of your body metaphors, even like from the enzymes that's needed to shift seasons um, to, to what you just said around um yeah a, a different future and, and being able to shift into new realities ai actually the, the new things in ai do give me a lot of hope for being able to more fully live in our body and use technology which is is scary but um we are, we're gonna need some humanity in that realm too so i appreciate your perspective there patricia aguirre thank you so much for joining my podcast today I look forward to the next My time we get to speak. Yes, I would love that. Yeah, always a pleasure to be close to you, Sarah. Thank, Thank you. you.